Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here at the National Press Club at the announcement of an extraordinary partnership between Ariane, Lockheed Martin, and General Electric to develop the world's first supersonic business jet and have it in flight by 2025, certified and in flight by 2025. And we are here with uh, aviation legend, Dr. Richard Tracy, uh, who uh, got your PhD from uh, Caltech uh, and uh, have worked for Lockheed as well as Douglas and Lear, uh, and then the predecessor company of Arion, and you're now the chief uh, uh, technical uh, officer, and it's a real honor to speak with you. And you came up with the entire notion of the natural laminar flow. Talk to us a little bit about um, what that is, why it's different from other aircraft, and why it's so groundbreaking. And if you do want to take a half an hour to answer that question, we're happy to stay here and talk to you about it. Well, we're getting the lunch ready, so we'll try to shorten it. Uh, well, it's maybe a fine point, but uh, laminar flow has been around and known for over a century. Uh, what is still fairly recent, but only a half a century, is that uh, what is called compressibility or high speed tends to stabilize laminar flow. Now, what is it? It is a form of a boundary layer, the, the thin layer of air that's, that's uh, close to the surface and that sticks to the surface. And in most cases, that boundary layer is turbulent. Uh, because of the natural instability of the flow shearing uh, at, those, at those speeds. Uh, if the surface is smooth and the sh pressure distribution is a certain way, and especially if you're going fast, this boundary layer can be laminar, and that means that the skin friction drag of a, over a certain given size of, say, a square foot, uh, can be 10% of what it would be with a turbulent boundary layer. So that, in a sense, every part of that airplane that is laminar is almost not there as far as skin friction goes. So there's a big payoff in trying to make as many parts of the airplane as possible have a laminar boundary layer flow. Now, there's certain things you have to do to have that. One of them is not have a very highly swept wing like the Concorde, for example. Now, that's a beautiful, efficient, supersonic cruise wing, but it can't have laminar flow. It also has some difficulties uh, in low speed and takeoff and landing and so forth. So, the, which, which shaped the extraordinary shape of the wing in order to be able to give it some of those characteristics? Uh, in the case of the, the Arion, for example, it's a wing that looks more like the old Lockheed uh, F-104. Mm -hmm. Relatively low sweep, sharp leading edges, uh, and, and in fact, the Lockheed 104 could have been a laminar flow wing. It was tested by NASA in the 50s proven to have laminar flow when they sealed up the leading edge device, the, the droop leading edge, so it didn't have a gap or a hinge, because that's the other thing you have to do, is have a fairly smooth surface without a lot of rivet heads and uh, metal joint gaps and so forth. And, and uh, laminar flow, right? P-51 was a laminar flow wing, and we've seen uh, both, both blown and unblown, right, in order to help us try to get there. What are some other features, design features, um, also going even to inlet design, that as you look at this as one integrated airplane helps you get to, to, that, to that goal? Well, for a supersonic airplane, the, the inlet is much different than a subsonic inlet. And that means sharp leading edges, for example, very controlled shock waves uh, that are compressing the air going into the engine and also making it stable, the flow stable, so it doesn't unstart the way the SR-71 did occasionally. Uh, and that creates its own problems because that sharp leading edge works fine supersonically and even for transonic speeds, but isn't good for takeoff and landing. So we have a translating cowl that opens up and lets more air come in mm -hmm. uh, without being so disturbed by the sharp leading edges of the, of the inlet. That was uh, actually a key part that's not come up at any other point in this, which was uh, which answers uh, kind of a key question on that because I was going to ask you exactly how you guys did that, but but now <laughs> you don't have stealth as a limitation, for example, so it allows you to do um, some of those things. In terms of smoothness, I mean, what are some novel both manufacturing and design technologies you have to use in order to get that fundamental smoothness, smoothness in the wing, smoothness in the fuselage? Um, uh, you know, is it is it all composite technology? What are some of the things that will allow you to try to get um, what you need in order for, for you to be able to achieve um, not only the speed, right, but the lower the drag then, the, 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 the longer your range? Exactly. 
And you're right, the speed can be accomplished by just more and more power, but if you want to have long range at high speed, which is clearly where the high speed pays off, you have to have very low drag. Uh, I would say that the conditions for laminar flow could be met with almost any construction method, but they have to be carefully controlled and refined. So for example, if it's metal, with joints, those joints have to be nearly, uh, nearly flush, so that you, we, we know exactly how much, uh, how much uh, gap or uh, mis mismatch there can be, and it's very small. So it's easier to accomplish the levels of, of uh, smoothness and, and quality in a composite design than it is with a metal design. But that's not the reason we're using the composite design. And why are you using the composite design? Because a, a supersonic airplane, and ours specifically, is lar largely designed not only by strength, but also by stiffness. So this very thin wing uh, has to have a certain amount of torsional stiffness as well as bending stiffness. And while composites are stronger and stiffer, most of the strength gains are, are pretty much overridden by FAA requirements to uh, only use the allowable strength after a barely vis visible damage event. So you're using about half the strength of a composite of a composite material, whereas the stiffness isn't affected by uh, that kind of damage, that kind of uh, use, if you will. So we get a f over a factor of two stiffness to weight with, with carbon fiber composite versus, say, aluminum. The range has always been um, a, a shortcoming of supersonic jets. Um, Concorde uh, was able to go transatlantic, but it did not have much more range than that. It used, you know, even though it was very efficient as it was, with afterburners to for on takeoff and then an afterburner to get you over through the sound barrier. But then, pretty efficient if you consider, you know, the Olympus engine is is not not exactly a spring chicken when it was for design. Talk to us about how you guys are going to get the kind of ranges you're talking about, whether it's from Heathrow to Hawaii, uh, you know, or excuse me, Heathrow to uh, Los Angeles or Los Angeles to Singapore. You're talking about some vast ranges that are normally out of the can of a supersonic airplane. How are you going to achieve that? Well, we're not, we'd love to have five or 6,000 nautical miles supersonic range. We, we, we will not have that, uh, and partly because of the engine. Uh, the, the Olympus engine is, is very efficient, actually, at supersonic speeds. Uh, we can't do that these days because of the airport noise requirements, Part 36 requirements. So it forces us into a high bypass, large engine that has its own weight and especially drag penalties that, that are uh, working against us. So we're happy if we get over 4,000 nautical miles supersonic range, and we look as, as if we're going to be able to do that. And that, plus a longer transonic range at 0.95 Mach number, lets us meet virtually all of the uh, missions that, that business jets want to fly. Uh, well, let me ask you about that. So 0.9 and that regime tends to be something unpopular that people don't like to live in. You have a lot of heat, uh, a lot of other challenges that come from that. How are you getting around some of those challenges that have kept almost everybody else out of that range? Sonic Cruiser was supposed to be in 0 0.95, 0 0.98 uh, until you know the company concluded that's just a tough place to live. Well, it is a tough place to live. One of the advantages of our laminar flow wing is it also likes very much to live at 0 0.95. That's its most. That's our airplane's most efficient operating point. Uh, even at lower Mach numbers like eight tenths, uh, we do better at 9.5, which we we wouldn't if we either had a highly swept wing, such as the uh, ones you're talking about. So that's, that's just, just the way it is. But uh, going past Mach 1, or really very close to Mach 1 or beyond, the drag does, does go up, and there's nothing much you can do about it. Uh, you do the best you can, and then the drag levels off somewhat, and drops even a little bit between 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3 or 4, which is our sweetest uh, supersonic cruise point. And, and so when we're talking about that kind of long range, you're doing it at like 0.95 rather than supersonic? If we're doing over 4,000 nautical miles. But we do 4,000 uh, supersonic. We, we are over 5,000, we're saying 5,400 at this point, uh, transonic. Uh, but almost any flight involves a mix. Right. I mean, so unlike most airplanes that have a range spec, we have realized that there isn't one range spec. And the best balance we've been able to find for most missions is to have uh, this 
some optimization for both 0.95 and for 1.4, and these are the numbers that have come out. Um, as somebody who's um, spent a lifetime doing this and has been an innovator in this, what's the next breakthrough that has to happen for us to be able to have large supersonic aircraft that can go into passenger service game-changingly, um, right? I mean, for us who fly a lot, it's, it still takes you a lot of time to get transoceanic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, anybody who's flown the Concorde was really game changing. Three and a half hours here in London was just an unbelievable thing. But, you know, what are some of the other changes in science and materials and technology that have to happen that get this into the realm of the average person, whether it's in 10 years or 20 years, will we'll be able to use? I'm going to demur because. I'm not an airline specialist. Right. I don't know that business. Technically, uh, some relaxation of the, of the uh, landing takeoff airport noise restrictions, Part 36, uh, Chapter 14 in the ICAO lingo, uh, have to change. And they're mandated both internationally and by the US uh, FAA to have specific requirements that are adapted to supersonic airplanes, so that, the, so that the requirements are a blend between the desire to have a social acceptance and what is technically and economically feasible. And whether that will happen or not, we're, I don't know. But it, it'll, it'll make a huge difference in the cost and of, of, of supersonic flight and the range possible possibility. And uh, one, let me ask you one question. Are you, is this airplane at all wasp wasted or, or not um, in order to try to deal with um, you know, shockwave and a whole bunch of other things? It, it is area ruled. Area ruled. Yeah, so it, very heavily. I mean, it's ab absolutely. We still have shockwaves. What we're not doing is trying to reduce the sonic boom. Uh, that will happen as a result of the work Lockheed is doing with NASA on the so-called Quest program, right. uh, where, the, where they're exercising uh, the technology to reduce boom. And we know that technology, or at least we've worked on it, we've done some stuff, but it, it, it imposes a penalty on the drag and therefore the range of the airplane. And since there's no requirement that you can satisfy to go to create a sonic boom yet, uh, there's no reason to penalize your airplane to try to meet that sonic boom requirement. Um, because that's, uh, when I've talked to friends of mine, one of the things that they've said is, you know, the big challenge is sonic boom over land and environmentalists and then everybody gets worked up and then so, you know, even a worthy project can end up dying because of that. Because, you know, even, even a baseball going at supersonic speed is going to put out a big shock wave and that's going to put out a bigger shock wave than a baseball. I'm not sure of that. <laughs> Baseball is a pretty bad <laughs> design from a drag standpoint, but the point will take it. Yeah, it, it's uh, uh, so again, th th this may or may not happen. Get to get uh, supersonic flight approved over land, not just by the FAA, right. uh, but par pardon me, low boom approved over land. What is a low boom? And is FAA and ICAO, what are they going to approve? Right. How, how much complaints from the public can they tolerate? How big a drag penalty will it right. incur? Um, I have so many more questions I'd like to ask you, sir, but I'm going to wish you a great holiday and a happy new year and look forward to being in touch in the future.